Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is a review of the Tamron 35 to 150 f2 to 2.8 but for the Nikon Z mount now you might be saying Jared have you reviewed this lens before and the answer is well kind of I reviewed the Sony one when it was for the E mount now it's out for the Nikon Z mount so where did I take this lens out to test well I took it down to Margate to photograph a four-year-old's birthday party where Richie was at and his kid was there so I took some photos of Richie's kid on the beach as well as took some photos in the park of another friend's kid running around playing on uh, uh, eating watermelon and going through some of the water fountains because that is a good way to test this out now before I get much further I do want to say that we did not build out the store set at the new studio we're at the new studio now and this is my desk set and when we do get the store set built out we will be on that for videos just like this one so being that I've already reviewed the Sony one you might see some b-roll that we reused from that Sony video because basically these lenses are exactly the same except for the mount so you can see that the Nikon is ever so slightly taller I wish I was a little bit taller I wish I was a baller I wish I had a rabbit in a hat and a bat and a 6.4 Impala. I don't know why he wanted a bat though. But we know how good the Sony version was. It was so good that I actually bought it. I own this. I bought this. This is my lens. Anyway, let's jump in to the feel and the outside of this lens. This is a substantial feeling lens. What do I mean by substantial? Well, it weighs in at 2.62 pounds. That is 1190 grams, and that is just 0.2 heavier than the Sony version. It's probably a little bit of extra weight inside of the mount somewhere, giving you the difference. But that is a pretty hefty lens, and it feels like it's built really well. Now, in terms of your zoom range and your throw, this is 35, this is 150. So it's not a very far throw. You could just do it with a quick twisty McTwisterson of your thumb and forefinger and get through the range. Now, I do feel that it is a little tight on the zoom. Let's see this one. Yeah, they feel exactly the same. I would like to see it a little looser, just a little bit less tight, but maybe that will change over time. And part of that is that some people don't want the lens creep when they turn the lens upside down and they're walking and they don't want the lens to automatically extend. So it's kind of a trade off whether you want it to be tight or if it's loose, it's gonna end up slipping and you don't want that slippage happening. Now, if you don't want the slippage happening at all, you do have a lock right here to lock it in your bag so it doesn't extend. And then you just go ahead and unlock it when you wanna go ahead and zoom. Now there's a couple of buttons right here. You can pre-program those to whatever you would like. You've got your AF to MF switch, you've got your custom uh, set to one, two, and three, but you will notice that this lens does not have IBIS. Now, maybe that's because of price, maybe that's because of weight, and honestly, most cameras today have image stabilization built in. And yes, it's gonna be better when you've got double the stabilization, one in the body and one in the lens, but when you're getting something like this that is kind of like the one lens to rule them all, you gotta make some trade-offs in certain situations, and in this case, it's leaving out the IBIS. One thing that I find interesting is that they have a USB-C port right here, and that's for updating the firmware, but there's no cap on it, so it's kind of always exposed, and well, that's not that big of a deal, but I've never actually updated firmware to a lens like this. Now, you do have your lens hood. It is a bayonet-style lens hood, which means when you're not using it, you do this, and when you are using it, you take it out and you put it on. I highly recommend that you always use the lens hood because you kind of don't look good when your lens hood is turned the other way. Yes, you do look not professional when you do that, and some people are fine with that, but the lens hood does more than just protect your lens from you bouncing it off of something. It cuts down on extra light coming in. Now you have an 82 millimeter filter thread. So if you have an 82 millimeter filter, you have one of those Peter McKinnon ND or variable ND filters. That would be pretty good on this because when you're shooting at F2 at 35, maybe you just want to cut down on the amount of light coming in, but still be able to shoot at F2. Now you do have a nine blade aperture. So you can see at 35 millimeters what the background looks like when it's totally obliterated 
obliterated. And the same thing at 150, you get a nice separation from the background. But most importantly is that this lens covers so much of a range. You've got a 35, a 50, an 85, a 105, a 135, and of course a 150. That is a huge range and you go from 2 to 2.8. Normally when you see a variable aperture lens, it's like f4 to 6.3. And that is a huge difference in light gathering capability. And with this, you only go from 2 to 2.8. Now let me tell you where this all happens. So at 35 millimeters, you're at f2. Now where does it go away from f2? Well, 40. At 39 millimeters you're still at f2 which is great but of course when you tick over to 40 millimeters and a little bit up from there you're at 2.1 and then when you get to 75 millimeters you're at 2.2 and then from 85 to 129 you're at 2.7 which means that from 130 all the way out to 150 you're at f 2.8 that really doesn't mess with your exposure that much but when you go from the 35 at f2 all the way out to 150 that is a pretty interesting range in terms of the light gathering changing. So you might wanna be a little quick on the shutter speed to counteract any of the loss or gaining of light. You will see that in your electronic viewfinder as you go ahead and do your zooming. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this photo taken with the Tamron 35 to 150 and edited with Fropac 4. That's right, let's start with Blue's Clues, followed by Brooklyn, C41, Coppertone, DeLorean, High C, Kaleidoscope, Mel Brooks, Saltwater Taffy, Thick, Tintype, Wet Hot American Summer, and of course, let's go all the way back to Fro Pack 1 for my all-time favorite called Skittles with one click and boom. So look, if you want to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point and you just want presets that work, we created 14 brand new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. If you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to get the Grand Slam bundle, which includes Fropack 1, 2, 3, and 4, and of course Skittles, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. I use this lens on the Nikon Z9, which means it's gonna be the same as it is on the Nikon Z8. But before we get into the autofocus and how it did, was it good, was it not good, let's show you a montage, take you inside the electronic viewfinder so you can see the autofocus in action. So how do you think the autofocus did? 
I think it did pretty well. Now there were times where you saw that it got stuck on the cheek and didn't move up to the eye, but the images were still fine. I don't know if this is a Tamron connectivity talking to the Nikon issue, or is it a Nikon autofocus thing just because of the Nikon focusing system? I don't know which one is which. Now I will say that with the Sony, the Sony felt like it focused ever so slightly quicker but even with the Nikon, it wasn't like it was slow. It was fast. It's not like I ever saw it jumping around. It just seemed to go where it needed to go, and it did a very good job. Now, I didn't test it on a Z6, a Z7, a Z5, a Z30, a ZFC, or whatever it's called, the ZF, uh, yeah, the ZFC is the crop sensor, but you know how those systems focus. This doesn't focus much different than a native Nikon lens does on its system. So you know the limitations of your autofocusing system. Just know that it's gonna be very similar to what you're used to. But let's jump into some of the pictures right here and take a look. So this is Richie playing with his son. We're at 35 millimeters and yes, he did get him a Nikon Cool Picks to play with. Oh, by the way, this is edited with uh, C41 from Fropac 4. C41 gives you a filmic look. That's a really good one. And then this is 35 and this is 150. You notice that in the EVF footage, it kind of got stuck on his cheek a little bit, but you can see that when we zoom in here, it is perfectly fine. Uh, it handled really well, and that's your 35 all the way out to 150, so you have such a tremendous range. Uh, I really loved the feel that I got outside. Look how it obliterates the background. Now, we're at 116 millimeters, and this is at f2.8. He's nice and sharp. The focus looks good. Uh, uh, this also is from C41 from Fropac 4. Continuing on, we've got 119 millimeters we got our 2.8 this is actually edited with one called copper tone beautiful look for the beach that one is fantastic and then I wanted to get closer 35 millimeters because I wanted the f2 not easy to do with kids because they don't stay there too long they move really quick but you can see how much it obliterates the background as you get close and fill the frame with your subject this one is done with kaleidoscope 35 millimeters again this is done with kaleidoscope as well so I'm really happy with the colors I'm happy with the tones I'm happy with what I was able to pull out of it in the situation that I was shooting in no no I didn't get to shoot a concert situation like I did with the Sony but we already know how that worked in the concert situation and it's going to be very similar because they're basically the same lenses just with different mounts continuing on i have a question for you guys this one or this one i kind of lean to the one with him to the left i don't care that i cut his ear off it just kind of feels more natural to me but you might like this one centered um, yourself. But I, I do want to show you something. Let me go into the develop real quick because there's something from Fropac 4. We have these down here called adaptive presets, X1, X2, X3. I kind of love X3 because it just finds the eyes. Watch this. When you go in, you go into the mask after you click it. It automatically highlights the eyes. So you can go in there and tweak them. Now you don't want to make them look like a white walker. So I have it ever so slightly raised. You can see right here, we turn it off. That's what it looks like. You turn it on. It just gives it a little bit of kick in the face. But these adaptive presets are fantastic because you can sync them from image to image to image and it will automatically find the eyes. No longer do you try to sync eyes from one image to the other and you end up with like forehead eyes, which don't look good at all. Moving on, I did have a little bit of trouble with the focus trying to shoot through the water fountain, but you're gonna have that trouble with every camera because if the water is in the foreground and it really can't find the face or find the eye, it's gonna be an issue. In this case, it worked out. So get that full body, looks great. We're at 98 millimeters, 2.7. This is back to 35 millimeters. 35 millimeters. All these are edited with Kaleidoscope, by the way, from Fropac 4. I love this. Just look at that look. I did brighten the eyes ever so slightly just to make it pop just a little bit more. And this is the difference between 35 millimeters and 83, so close to 85. But you can see how it's bowed a little more at 35, plus you're closer to the kid. That's just what it's gonna look like. It's fine, but even at 2.7, the trash can in the background is obliterated. The background is obliterated. It looks absolutely fantastic. This is one of those lenses. This is a one lens to rule them all. That's why I bought it for the Sony. If they had it for Canon, I would probably buy it for Canon because I think it's a great travel lens for a professional. If you were traveling to say Paris and you just wanted one lens, you could have your 35, you could have your 50, you could do portraits, you could shoot your croissants, you could shoot everything you want. But the question is, does it pass the sniff test and the wind tunnel test? Let's see. Oh my God. 
Smells like one of those pink erasers in school. I used to try to eat those, by the way. Mmm. I used to try to eat those. They, they, they were tasty. But let's try the wind tunnel test from the seat. This is very difficult because I've never done it seated. Seated. <laughs> Ooh. Definitely passes the wind tunnel test. So how much is it? This is $1,999. It's a $2,000 lens. It's $100 more than the Sony version. Not sure why. Is Nikon charging them a premium? I don't know. But all in all, this is a fantastic win for Nikon. This is a tremendous lens to have in the arsenal. Yes, it's expensive at $2,000, but you're replacing a 35. You're replacing a 50. Uh, you're replacing an 85, a 105, a 135, and a... 150 as well. So yeah, there's always going to be a trade-off. Would I trade my one twos for this? The answer is no. But if I'm traveling around and I just want quality that I can get from one lens, then yeah, this is something I might take around uh, quite often. So what do you guys think about this? Let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.